can be, uh, we can say that of the man, and we can say that of this prosopon, this person, Christ, right? We can say it of that person, Christ. So, in Christ, these two things are united, but we are not, what Nestorius is saying, we are not supposed to say that God was born. Um, so this is his approach. St. Cyril of Jerusalem is from approaching it from that other angle, from uh, the word taking on flesh. And he sees what he's saying in his teaching as a commentary on what Nicaea taught. He sees himself as being in, he's being that faithful disciple of that great father of the church from Alexandria, St. Athanasius, and he's just explaining what Athanasius would have said. Um, that in the creed, that creed from Nicaea talks about the only begotten Son of God, true God of true God, through whom all things were made, that he became, so the word of God became incarnate. Oh, so he's focusing on what the creed said and taking it extremely seriously. The Word of God became incarnate. The Word taking on flesh, not this attempt to meld the two together and somehow get a man in, a, in the Word of God somehow. To, but the Word takes on flesh. This is his approach. He suffered, died, rose, and ascended into heaven. And he says in one of his letters to Nestorius, and this letter is going to ultimately be presented to the Council of uh, Ephesus. But this is an early letter in the back and forth in the controversy. He hears what, uh, from across the Mediterranean Sea, what Nestorius is teaching uh, from his, some of his monks who are up there. And they come back, and, um, and then he responds. So this is back and forth of letters. He says, the word having an ineffable, now this is one of those words which if you've been following the uh, controversy in our own translation of the Roman Missal. There is a, at least one bishop in this country who thinks this word is not understandable by the average Christian. Well, ineffable simply means beyond words, right? Okay, do you understand what it means? It's something ineffable? You don't have the words to explain it. All right. Okay. The word having an ineffable and an inconceivable manner, personally united to himself, flesh that was animated with a living soul. He became man and was called son of man. And that while the natures which were brought together into this true unity were diverse, so both fully God and fully man, there was of both one Christ and son. So that emphasis on the unity, right? And that the unity is going to be found in the word, in the person of the word. Inasmuch as the Word was personally united, has personally united Himself to a human nature, and come and come forth from a woman, Saint Cyril is going to say, He is said to have been born of the flesh. So He is not going. They're going to start disagreeing on what you can attribute to Christ as God. He's going to say because He has taken on flesh, Christ, who is, uh, who is. A divine person with a fully human nature, full human soul, full human body. We can say he became flesh because he has taken on that nature and was born through that nature, right? And that through that human nature, he also, all aspects of it, he also uh, grew up. He also uh, suffered. He also died. He also rose from the dead. So all these things we can uh, attribute to Christ and say of it in a certain way of God, because the Word of God has taken on that flesh. But not, we, we don't say it of divinity as divinity, we say it of uh, the Incarnation, right? Because in God, say, what, one thing St. Cyril of Alexandria will say is that um, God has come, the Word of God has taken on our flesh to know, to claim us as His own, so that we may be His possession, and that he may have this experience of being human. Uh, God, there's nothing added to God, right? Fully perfect. But yet there is this mode of expressing that, which is unique and new. If we reach, one of the terms that's going to come out of this controversy is called the hypostatic union. Um, 
Again, not a phrase that you use on the street most days. But in the, uh, in the person of uh, that, in this one being, in this one being here, are fully united the human and the divine nature, right? The person of the Word of God is what has taken on, fully taken on human flesh. Not just the outward trappings that Apollinarius would say, but the internal, the, the soul, everything about it has fully taken it on. And so we have a complete and whole human nature, a complete and whole divine nature, and in that divine nature is the person, right? And it is the person that unites these two and makes it one actor, one subject. There is unity, and yet uh, there is that distinction as well. So, St. Cyril will say, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, from the, the um, first chapter of the Gospel of John. So the Virgin is rightly called the Mother of God, or in Greek, Theotokos, the Bearer of God. Not as if, so this is one of the things that Nestorius and his followers were saying, if you call her the Mother of God, you're saying that God didn't exist before she gave birth. And they're saying, that is not what we're saying. Not as if in as, uh, the God had, had its beginning from the Virgin, but inasmuch as His holy body, endowed with a rational soul, was born of her to which the Word was personally unified. So His approach, if we're going to draw, if you uh, learn better through graphics, might look something like this. That we have the Logos or the Word of God up there. Now, this is one of his little weaknesses, which is going to cause problems in our next <coughs> section next week. He doesn't like to use the word nature. He doesn't, using the nature, he, he's going to say that all the, um, all the divine qualities, they are perfectly there and they are not lost at all. They are perfectly there, they're kept there. And there, he is also, uh, the man Jesus is fully man. All of the qualities, but he doesn't, he's not going to use the term nature. Um, that, that Lucia, that, that, um, that, they are fully there. And in the hypostasis, that being, that substantiation. So what do we mean by hypostasis? Well, we could have, um, um, Fido is the dog I know, right? And it's a hypostasis of dogginess, the nature of dog. But in Christ, um, there is the, the Word of God is the hypostasis, right? The, of the Word of God, that third person, of the, or the second person of the Trinity, and which is now take, fully taken on that human nature. That is what the one actor. So we do not call uh, Jesus Christ a human being. We call him a divine being. We call him fully man, fully God. But calling him a human being is... Actually, he's the divine being acting, right? Fully man, we do say that, but uh, so that's subtle languages, subtle distinction in language, and a little uh, icon there in the corner of St. Cyril of Alexandria. Uh, Nestorius, for him, each nature remains distinct and unaltered in that union, so he's very intent on keeping that distinction. And he uses the term conjunction, I think. Because he wants to make sure that no one gets confused and starts thinking that somehow if Christ is able to do this because his humanity has now been raised to a kind of a demigod level, something like that. He wants to uh, ensure, ensure against that. Uh, the human and divine acts can both be attributed to that, con that conjunct, per that person that's formed by these two things coming, coming together and kind of being right next to one another. Um, and that is, he calls Christ. He calls that a person and calls Christ. But what's the glue that keeps it together? That's, that's the underlying question, which he can't quite say what it is. Um, the problem is that that prosopon, that word, what does person mean for him? When he says person, and he says the word of God is a person, and the man Jesus is a person, and this Christ is a person, he's using it three times. So it's very confusing, especially the way we think of it, right? But over time, it was, so this is also one of the, this confusion, what is this guy saying? And he's, is he totally?